Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Timothy Lee, and I'm a research analyst at Red Cloud Securities. I'm delighted to host a Red Cloud webinar on polymetallic exploration today. We will hear from John Schmier, Vice President of Exploration of Murchison Minerals. During today's webinar, he will provide an overview and outlook. Uh, then we will take questions. You can type your questions into the chat box at any time, and we will get to as many as we can. Uh, before we kick things off, first we need to discuss uh, the fine print during this Murchison webinar, forward-looking statements may be made. I would direct listeners to the company's forward-looking statements disclosure outlined on page two of the company's corporate presentation, and that can be found on the company's website, murchisonminerals.ca. For Red Cloud Securities, Inc., I would highlight that this webinar is for information purposes only. It should not be considered a solicitation or a recommendation to buy or sell securities. We note that this call does not consider the particular situation or needs of individual investors, and participants should rely on their own investigation and seek their own professional advice before investing. Please see our most recent research located on the Red Cloud website for specific disclosures pertaining to Murchison. So we have Murchison presenting today. The company has two strong projects, a, a zinc copper silver VMS deposit in Saskatchewan and a nickel exploration project in Quebec. Uh, with that, I now turn it over to John to update our audience on the company. Yeah, well, thank you. I'm happy to be here. Uh, yeah, like I said, my name is John Schmier. I'm the Vice President of Exploration for Murchison Minerals. Uh, Tro Troy Beaujolais, our President and CEO, gives his apologies. He had a sudden conflict come up. So uh, I'll be happily taking you through uh, through our presentation today. So uh, first off, uh, I always like this picture. This is a good image of our mass of sulfide from uh, our most recent round of drilling out in our Quebec project. This is from our second hole of the program, which I'll go into a bit more detail further in the presentation. So, you know, typical legal disclaimer, you already just heard it. So, you know, proceed with caution. Um, so Murchison Minerals. Um, so we're focused on on critical minerals, uh, specifically metals related to the the battery kind of revolution and, and the you know green energy revolution. So we're focused on on nickel, copper, cobalt, and zinc, and and specifically within top ranked jurisdictions within Canada. So in this case, Saskatchewan and Quebec, which are both uh, top ranked, as according to the Fraser Institute. So just a little bit about uh, our process and, and the people involved. So um, the way we conduct our exploration is uh, we specifically focus in underexplored areas where we move in and we take a very dominant land position there um, and go about it that way. So it's, uh, you know, and then very much focused on putting out the geoscience first. So systematically testing our targets with the latest technologies um, and then, you know, obviously advance the projects the most efficient and cost-effective way possible. So we have our HPM nickel copper cobalt project out in Quebec, and then our BMK uh, or Brabant McKenzie VMS uh, project in Saskatchewan, which I'll be talking about in, in, in great detail. Um, just a bit about the people involved. So we have a really highly experienced board where we have JC Potvin. Uh, you know, he's a, a former gold analyst, a top ranked gold analyst with Burns Fry. Um, you know, he started a company called uh, Pangea Goldfields after that which in the late 90s, which transacted in the early 2000s for about 200 million. Uh, and then we have Don Johnson, who's the uh, largest shareholder in the company. He owns just under 35% of us. Uh, he, and he's an institution really on Bay Street. Uh, former, uh, formerly with uh, uh, Burns Fry and was the former vice chair of uh, BMO uh, Nesbitt Burns. Uh, as well as we have, uh, you know, some other strategic shareholders, uh, for example, Michael Gentile owns just under 10% of us on a fully or a partially diluted basis. Um, and, you know, we're, we're just over 50% uh, of strategic and, and insider investors. So pretty tightly held. Um, and then uh, solid management. So as I mentioned, our CEO and, and president, uh, Troy Beaujolais joined us recently. And then uh, well as myself as the vice president of exploration, but uh, we also pride ourselves on working with uh, some of the leading minds as uh, bring them on as uh, technical advisors for our projects to, uh, you know, really put out that geoscience first. So uh, on our HPM nickel copper cobalt project, we've been working with Dr. Peter Lightfoot. Um, you know, he's really top name in the, in the nickel field. And then more recently we've uh, brought in uh, Dr. Stephen J. Piercy, uh, who is a, a renowned VMS, for, uh, VMS expert to work with us on our BMK project. Uh, just a little bit about the share structure. So, you know, we have 241 million shares out. 
Uh, we're currently trading at four cents and uh, we have a $9.6 million market cap. Um, I'll be getting into this in more detail, but this just kind of roughly highlights the, the areas that uh, where the projects are located. So obviously Brabant and Saskatchewan, they're kind of in the North Central region. Uh, and then uh, HPM, uh, somewhat close to Labrador border um, on the kind of far uh, eastern side of Quebec. But, uh, you know, I'll get into a bit more detail, but both of them with excellent access to infrastructure and, and some considerable zones of mineralization already uh, found. And both of those projects are 100% owned. So Brabant or BMK. So, you know, first kind of laying out the location and a bit of a framework, I, I really like showing this slide. It, it uh, you know, it really encapsulates the potential well. So on the map here, those dark blue um, shapes there, that's the mineral claims that form the, the Brabant or BMK project. But all the red dots we're looking at on here, these are significant VMS deposits. So to the south of us, this is we're, right now we're looking at the Saskatchewan Manitoba border. There's the Flin Flon Belt, which has had over 100 years of EMS mining. So a very you know prestigious belt. Uh, currently, there's the Lowler Mine producing uh, by Hud Bay on the far eastern side of that, and the Snow Lake Belt. And then uh, there's the Miklavina Bay deposit on the uh, Saskatchewan side, which is being developed by Foran. It's really looking like it's moving towards a production decision here right away, you know, and they've got a very significant market cap. Uh, I think this number's a little bit dated now, but they're just over a billion dollars now. Um, but, uh, and then you look to the north and there's the, the Lynn Lake Belt, which has had some significant VMS deposits found. Specifically, there's the, the Rutan VMS uh, mine there, which actually produced 55 million tons at 1.2% copper, 1.41. So very, very significant. And then right at the border, there's the Fox Lake uh, former mine. Again, some pretty significant grades and tonnage. And that's right at the border. But you actually, if you trend those rocks into Saskatchewan, there's the, uh, the the great feature of the border, which seems to stop the deposits. And that, that's not actually a function of geology. That's a, that's a policy. So um, you know, there's been a significant lack of base metal exploration on the Saskatchewan side, and that's largely related back to uh, a company called the SMDC, the Saskatchewan Mining and Development Corporation, which, uh, you know, kind of nationalized the, uh, the exploration and, uh, you know, significantly hampered the exploration until that was uh, made up a public company. So, you know, you look at those Larange belts, rocks, and then just off that, we have that brown area. That's uh, what we call the McLennan Lake belt, where, you know, it's... Uh, a backyard type setting, which is kind of the most ideal location to explore for VMS deposits. And so we've, we have one there, the BMK deposit, which I'll get into more detail. And then, you know, we, we see this as a top potential to host more. I'll get into that in more detail. But uh, one thing I just also want to mention is that the, the Flin Flon belt and that Larange belt, they, uh, they're they related volcanic type rocks to one another, similar age, and just Again, purely one's been explored and one hasn't. So we see really equal opportunity within those rocks as to the Flint Flint Belt. So like I mentioned, we're 100% owned. Uh, we have excellent access to infrastructure. Uh, we have a highway, uh, Highway 102, that runs right through the property and runs within two kilometers of the deposit. So really ideally situated. We have the community of Brabant Lake that's only three kilometers away from the deposit. Um, that's our base of operations. I'll get into a bit more detail on that. Uh, and then we have high uh, high voltage power that runs right through the property, and it also runs uh, within uh, within two kilometers of the deposit. Uh, and that high voltage power line that feeds uh, you know that that feeds the CB Santoy uh, gold mine complex there. So, um, and that's hydroelectric power. Getting a bit further into the geology, so like I mentioned, it you know similar geological environment to that of the kind of Flint Flon, Lallard, Lynn Lake, Snow Lake belts, but again, kind of a in the unexplored Saskatchewan side. Um, it's a felsic volcanic clastic uh, sedimentary type deposit uh, that's kind of similar to uh, you know deposits such as uh, the Bathurst Camp mining camp out in uh, New Brunswick or the uh, Iberian Pyrite belt. Um, and it's, uh, you know, like I mentioned, we, we take dominant land packages, so we really have a, a significant land holding here. You can see on that map on the left, those are uh, geophysical conductors. We have huge trends and, uh, you know, the BMK deposit is kind of in the middle, but we have now picked up uh, showings along strike of that, uh, which we're happily starting to prove that theme that this uh, isn't the only 
VMS deposit within the area. So, you know, again, speaking to that, you know, that VMS deposits form in clusters, and we, we currently have one deposit, uh, but we've now, we've picked up mineralization at our Betty target and our main lake target. We also have uh, picked up mineralization uh, considerably to the north, our street lake target. And those kind of are, are over a strike lake of uh, strike length of 37 kilometers. And so when you, you know, you put a, you put a scale bar next to the flin flon, kind of uh, the bulk of the deposits right you know, that's, that's a strike length of 25 kilometers. So significant potential to host multiple deposits within that, uh, within that size. So the deposit itself, so it's, uh, it's a sulfide deposit uh, dominated by pyrotite with the main economic minerals of interest being sphalerite, calcopyrite, and galena. Uh, it comes to surface and it dips 51 degrees to the Northwest. Uh, it's, it's very sizable. So currently it, it remains open at, long strike and at depth, but it's, uh, you know, it has a current strike length of 1.1 kilometers uh, in it. Uh, you know, we've, we've drilled it down to a, a dip length of uh, 800 meters, but that just happens to be the deepest drilling. So it's it's still wide open at depth. It's uh, in two lenses, the upper and the lower mineralized zone. Um, they're about 30 meters apart, but uh, sometimes they come together uh, and merge, but uh, on average about 30 meters apart. Um, with some pretty significant thicknesses, you know, both of those uh, get up to a maximum thickness of around 24 meters. Um, getting into that resource. So currently that, that resource is from 2018 um, and it's uh, an indicated of, of 2.1 million tons. That's at 7% zinc, 0.69% copper, 0.49% lead and 0.23 gold and 39.6 grams per ton silver. So pretty significant. And then with an additional inferred resource of 7.6 million tons. So quite a sizable deposit. We're, we're happy to continue working on it and continuing to grow that. Um, so speaking about that expansion, you know, so like we mentioned, it, it's um, open along strike and at depth that's kind of highlighted in this figure along uh, in that kind of pinkish area around the edges of that uh, gridded out uh, mineral domain. Of, of the deposit. Uh, and then in the core here, so you can see in the grading, this is related to grade. There really appears to be a high grade core within the deposit with, uh, and there's areas there that are in the cool blue colors. And those cool blue colors are just related to lack of drilling. So we infer with additional drilling in there that we should be able to pull up those grades significantly. So there's also significant potential to upgrade the resource grade. Um, you know, just kind of talking about some of the resource history there. So, you know, kind of very much in the growth phase of growing the resource. So in 2008, 115 holes, totaling only 30,000 30, uh, 30, meters. So that was that, uh, you know, kind of a, uh, an indicated resource of uh, 2.9, but, or sorry, indicated of 1.47 million tons and 2.9 indicated uh, or inferred. So, you know, we've significantly grown it past that point with uh, only, you know, with minimal amount of additional drilling in 2018. And so we, we strongly feel that we can continue to really grow that resource. Um, so again, just a bit of a, or here's a bit of a deposit comparison. So, you know, I mentioned that there's the four ends, uh, Mecklenburg Bay deposit to the South of us in the Saskatchewan, you know, that, that company has uh, worked really hard and they've grown the market cap to around a billion dollars. Uh, but here's just a specific, comparison between their deposit and ours. So, you know, the Miklavina Bay massive sulfide zone totals, you know, around 12 million tons. That's quite comparable in size to our massive sulfide zone at the moment. And they're quite comparable in grade. Um, but they really have grown their resource very significantly past that stage by finding their copper stock work zone. So the copper stock work zone for the uh, makes up the bulk of the resource for the uh, Miklavina Bay deposit. And uh, so working with Dr. Stephen Piercy on, uh, on the BMK deposit, we sat back about a year ago and we really went through the geology. And uh, we went back, did systematic relogging, systematic resampling. And, and what really jumped out to us is that the Brave Ant Mackenzie deposit is missing its copper stock work zone. Uh, and we feel that's got a very significant exploration potential because you know we could see that same similar growth in our, in our resource if we were to find our copper zone. Um, and it's highly unlikely for these deposits to form without one, especially with one of our grade. You know, we're, 
our resource is quite high grade. And in order to get those kind of grades, you have to have what's called zone refining and those zone refined VMS deposits almost always have a copper stock work. So we, we just need to, uh, we need to find ours. So, you know, we're, we're pretty excited to continue our exploration and really hone in on that, which is kind of where I want to kind of point out uh, what we call our CST target, which is, well, it stands for copper stock work. So you can see this image on the bottom, that's the, the Brabant McKenzie deposit, just kind of highlighting some of the open zones. Uh, we actually have some pretty significant copper intersects just right on the borders of the, uh, on the bounds of the deposit. So, you know, we're, we're looking to expand those zones and explore there, but this CST target, that's a, a geophysical anomaly. We, uh, we remodeled out of some um, 2017 Helisam airborne uh, electromagnetic survey data. Um, and it really jumped out to us because it's of similar size and conductance to that of the Brabant McKenzie deposit. It's just a little deeper. Uh, it remains undrilled and we feel it has an enormous potential because it's only 400 meters directly along strike of the deposit. So, you know, we're, we're looking to be drilling that this winter. Um, and, you know, we're, you know, we, we see a lot of evidence that this potentially could be the, the missing copper stock work target. Um, as well, you know, I pointed out that three seven kilometer trend that uh, we see, we call that the BMK trend. That's kind of a long strike of the Brabant McKenzie deposit. Uh, we've picked up mineralization a kilometer to the north at our Betty target, which we drilled in 2021, uh, where we intersected some pretty significant grade uh, over uh, over about a meter. So, you know, but there were only a couple of holes in, a lot of room to grow that, you know, that's at 4% zinc, 1.3% copper and some significant silver. Uh, as well, we have our main lake target that's 10 kilometers long strike to the south. Uh, we drilled that in 2020, 2021, but again, we're only a few holes in. We intersected two lenses of uh, VMS mineralization with very significant VMS alteration, actually, which has us very excited. Uh, you know, one of those zones, you know, we intersected was three and a half meters of 0.8% uh, copper and 0.61 zinc. Um, so, you know, really proving to us that thesis that the BMK deposit isn't the lone isn't the lone deposit out here. We've got a lot more work to do ahead of us of, of proving up some of these new zones of mineralization, as well as looking for additional targets. And then we've got some great geophysical targets like our, our TOM2 and T2T, which uh, remain undrilled um, with the exception of, of uh, two holes that were drilled adjacent, which seems to have missed those geophysical targets. And, and we look in the future to, uh, to get in on those, um, but has us very excited about the potential. Um, so, you know, again, pointing out that community of Brabant Lake and our excellent access to infrastructure. So here on the, that top image, you can see there our resource and we're just, you know, essentially only a kilometer off the road, uh, you know, and, and we're kind of an ideal location, you know, not under a lake and we're only three kilometers away from the community of, uh, of Brabant Lake. Um, you know, it's, and we have year round access up there, um, drill permits currently in place. Uh, great relationships with the local First Nations, and this, you know, really leads to low-cost exploration. So we can be very uh, efficient with our spend. Um, and just, you know, touching about Brabant, you know, we're really happy to be working out of that community. We really feel we're part of it. They've really welcomed us open arms. We've actually owned three houses in the community, so we don't need to put up any exploration camps. So that really brings our costs down. Uh, and we hire locally. You know, we, we have a great working relationship. We've got a, a lot of personnel out of, that we hire out of the community who really help us out. So getting into our HPM project. So it's a nickel copper cobalt project out in Quebec again. Um, and, you know, one thing about Quebec is they, you know, they have a fully integrated battery, battery strategy that they're looking to develop. So that's, you know, local mining for battery technology metals, as well as the actual development and building of these. So, you know, really looking to support uh, critical mineral projects in the province right now. Um, and we have a very significant land holding there. So here's a great location map. So it's uh, again, 100% owned project. Uh, we're just to the right of the uh, Lac Manicouagan impact crater. That's that big round lake in Quebec, for those who know. Uh, there's a highway that runs along there, Highway 389. And then to the south of us, there's Port Cartier. To the north of us is Fermont. Fermont is a significant iron ore mining jurisdiction. And uh, there's a heavy rail line that actually runs right through the property that goes right to Port Cartier. So it's uh, pretty ideally located. The, as well, we're 
very close to the Hart John hydroelectric dam. Uh, hydroelectric power twins that rail line, so it runs right through the property. So really excellent access to uh, you know potential mine infrastructure. Uh, and we have a very significant land holding. So we actually own uh, 950 square kilometers. Uh, and those cover a, a very large mafic, ultra mafic intrusive complex, which is, you know, the, the ideal rocks to be looking for uh, magmatic nickel sulfide deposits. So just getting a little bit into the project history. So nickel mineralization was first found uh, at the property back in 1999 through prospecting from a very old VLF survey. That's when they discovered the Barta Fur Zone, which I'll be getting into more detail. Um, Falcon Bridge then was essentially forced to sell that through their merger with Extrata. So they got rid of all of their exploration properties. Uh, project was acquired then by Pure Nickel. And then that they partnered with uh, Murchison's predecessor company in 2007, and that was uh, Manicouagan Minerals. Uh, they completed drilling in 2008, had some really great success. And then unfortunately that was know, the, the market conditions in 2008, as we all know, were unfavorable. Uh, the project went dormant until Murchison was able to acquire 100% of that project uh, back in 2019. And that's when we really ramped up our exploration. Um, it covers the Manicouag and Metamorphic Complex, which is a significant package of, uh, of uh, mafic and ultramafic intrusive rocks uh, that are intruded with sulfide bearing metals, you know, that have uh, sulfide facies, uh, Metasedimentary tree rocks there that we can uh, infer to be our sulfide source. Uh, we've covered the bulk of the property um, with VTEM. Uh, you can kind of see uh, on that map highlighting all the dots there. Those are electromagnetic conductors, so a significant amount of uh, conductivity on the property that we're looking to work up. So the property hosts the Bar to Fur Zone, which we uh, were able to get in and drill in 2022. Uh, currently, that zone is only uh, defined by 35 drill holes, uh, only totaling uh, 8,900 meters. Uh, there, there are no resources yet been completed. Um, but, you know, that 2022 drilling, we were able to successfully extend the depth of mineralization down to 475 meters from the previous uh, 295 meters, and that still remains open. That's just, again, that's the deepest drilling that we've done. Uh, we extended the strike length from 315 meters to 370 meters, so again, remains open long strike and we continue to grow it. Um, the mineralization is kind of over a thickness of 150 to 200 meters through multiple lenses uh, with, you know, multiple individual lenses up to potentially 48 meters thick. Um, and that's a significant increase from the previously modeled thickness. Um, and, and we really view uh, the Bartifer zone as having very significant potential and as well as the rest of the property remains largely unexplored. Um, just some highlight drilling from, from the Bar de Fur zone. So specifically our, our second hole that we drilled from that 2022 program. Uh, you know, we, we drilled 121 meters of 1% nickel, half a percent copper and 0.07% cobalt. So some very significant grade and some very significant lengths. Um, you know, and some of those includes within those, you know, we have grades of nickel going up to almost 3% uh, over some pretty significant thicknesses. So, uh, very pleased with that and you know we're really eager to also continue drilling this prospect uh you know and the, the last previous best hole on the property was hpm 0803 which was drilled in 2008 from that program uh by manicoagan minerals where they drilled 57.8 meters and 1.38 percent nickel 0.7 copper and 0.07 percent cobalt so some pretty impressive uh results and you know kind of similar story to uh the Bray Band mckenzie uh, property and project, you know, kind of going into these areas that have been unexplored, that have a zone of mineralization, but we really feel that the rest of the property really requires a lot more work to prove up because they, we see kind of that, what we call mining camp scale potential. And, and we see that on the HPM project as well. So, you know, this is on the right, those are EM conductors. We have our BDF zone kind of in the middle to the right is the Sierra target where we picked up mineralization on surface. We've got a couple holes into it. Uh, those holes are also mineralized. And then, you know, there's the PYC zone, which has been drilled and is also, you know, that's a, a significant body of sulfide mineralization and, and the rest remain undrilled. And we've got a lot of work ahead of us. Uh, we rely on uh, prospecting using uh, 
a beat map, which lets you find these conductors on surface. And then we, we sample them with a backpack drill. And so doing that work, we found mineralization at our Tarao target, you know, 4048, some of these other zones, you can see some of those backpack drill cores at the bottom. So proving that these other conductors are, are related to nickel mineralization, we just need to follow up that work. And just kind of further highlighting that BDF trend. So highlighting that Sierra zone where we see very similar grades on surface. Uh, we drilled a hole in 2022 where we intersected low grade, but you know, over 277 meters thickness of disseminated mineralization. But we feel very strongly that there's a uh, highly conductive zone in there of massive sulfide. We're, we're looking to, uh, we're looking to find that right now because we feel it has a similar uh, equivalent prospectivity to that of the BDF zone. Uh, as well, you know, moving away from that, we have our other conductors where we picked up mineralization on surface and they remain completely undrilled. Um, yeah, so thank you. I'm happy to have walked you through Murchison, Murchison Minerals and happy to answer any questions. Great. Thank you very much, John. <clears throat> um, as John mentioned, we'll now move on to the Q&A portion of this webinar. A reminder to everyone on the line that you can type your questions into the chat box at any time. And we, we already do have a question or two. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about the specific exploration targets at BMK? And, and particularly, you had mentioned the, the copper stock work uh, potential there. Yeah, so that's, you know, we're really excited about that target. Because, you know, just wanting to re-highlight that, you know, we, we went back in, we remodeled some older geophysical data, um, and that target really jumped out at us because it's uh, you know similar scale to the BMK deposit, similar conductivity, and it's only 400 meters away. So that that's very encouraging to us. We actually just our last press release we put out, we went back in with the geophysical crew here, uh, and we put out a ground EM survey on that just to help us refine that for drilling this winter. And uh, you know we're just processing the results of that right now. So it's, it's got us very excited because it's, it's hard to find, uh, you know, it's when you're that close to your deposit, it's very encouraging. Great. And what uh, metallurgical test work has been done at BMK? Are there any deleterious elements? Um, so in 2021, we drilled a, uh, it's actually in the presentation that we drilled a, a hole kind of just outside of the indicated zone where we actually uh, intersected uh, 50 meters of, uh, of quite high grade mineralization. We split half that core and we set it into metallurgical testing at SRC uh, labs in Saskatoon here. And we got really impressive results. So kind of first pass metallurgical testing, uh, we were able to make a zinc concentrate of uh, approximately 90% recovery um, at about 50% zinc uh, with, and we think we can increase that through further optimization uh, as well that you know, that had about approximately 70% copper recovery with about a copper grade of 4%, which starts opening the door as well for us that we could potentially be looking at only one concentrate and not having to put it in a separate, uh, separate system, um, which is uh, quite encouraging. And, uh, you know, the one thing about it all is that uh, it's a very clean deposit, uh, very little deleterious elements, which uh, is, was great news. Great. And I think you'd mentioned this, but to kind of just to reiterate, are both projects 100% owned? Are there any royalties on the projects? Uh, both projects are 100% owned and uh, um, there is uh, no royalties on uh, the Brave Pat McKenzie deposit. Uh, the HPM project, um, there is a, a buyback agreement in uh, with Glencore in, okay. in there and, you know, uh, best to uh, send us an email for further clarification on that one. Okay. Uh, one question that's always popular, how much cash does the company have and uh, how far will that get you with your current plans? Um, uh, unfortunately, I was kind of tapped on the shoulder on this one uh, here right before this. Troy uh, is the best person to ask about our kind of the, the fiscal position of the company. Uh, I really am focused on the exploration potential. So, but currently, uh, you know, currently we have a, a significant amount of cash in the bank at the moment. But uh, you know, we'll be we'll be looking to uh, needing some more cash to get out into Brave Math this winter. Okay, great. Can you give us a? A little insight on community relations. Uh, are there First Nations at each project uh, and or other communities nearby? Yeah. 
Um, oh, yeah. So just for reference, we have a uh, one million in the bank for cash. Just okay. back to that for the question to clarify. Um, but for First Nations, the Brabant Mackenzie project, uh, yes. So there's the Lac La Ronge, uh, Indian Band is uh, adjacent, but that community of Brabant Lake that's there, that's actually a northern settlement. It's not part of uh, it's not part of that First Nations group, but many of the residents there are uh, are treaty members of that, um, and it's uh, we have a really great working relationship with them. So it's uh, so far it's, it's been really great. You know, we've been able to partner with a lot of their members, and we hire them locally, and it's it's been ideal. Uh, there's also First Nations in uh, Quebec, the, uh, the Wachat, McMahon, and Utenam, uh, and we're currently engaging with them on the project right now. Um, and I guess one question, looking at the on the nickel side, uh, what exploration targets on the nickel project are you most uh, excited about? Um, which targets? Um, the Sierra target has us very excited. Um, you know, I highlighted that multiple multiple times, but it's uh, it's only 300 meters away from the Bardafur zone, and uh, you know we we see a very strong geophysical conductor in there. That drilling that we completed in 2022 intersected some very broad intervals of disseminated mineralization, but really doesn't exploit that high grade um, mineralization we see on surface and that very strong geophysical conductor. So you know we feel uh, we feel very strongly that we've uh, we've come close to intersecting it, but we're we're looking to get back in there and find that zone because it's. Uh, we feel very strongly it's there. Okay, great. Um, I think that's all the questions we have, although one kind of just to review, uh, looking forward, what are some, kind of some key catalysts and, and news items we might look for uh, in the coming months? Uh, yeah, so so you know, expect some, some news as far as it goes, uh, you know, with some of our negotiations and, uh, um, you know, discussions that we're having with the uh, with the Wachat McMahon and Utenam out of Quebec and uh, you know specifically right now we're, we're focused on our, our BMK project so expect some news flow coming out of that great great well I'd like to again thank John Schmier for presenting today and thank you everyone on the line for tuning in have a great rest of your day